Hey everyone, my name is Centriel, and I'm Atalia Wentrick who is currently GM and peaked at over 1200 LP Challenger last season in NA. This is my full guide on how to play Talia. I tried to cover absolutely everything I could to ensure that every Talia player, no matter what skill from beginner to advanced, could get some value out of it. There are chapters and timestamps that point to all the different sections of the video so you can revisit certain parts or look for certain topics that you want to know more about. With that being said, let's start by figuring out why we should play Talia and establishing her identity. Talia is a scaling control mage that particularly plays well into heavy frontline and dash champions. As she scales throughout the game, her DPS and E can completely take over a teamfight. She is in many ways similar to a lot of control mages, but the one key difference is that Talia has higher emphasis on team play and roam potential. While most control mages generally tend to play quite selfishly and of course have an ultimate that does damage, Talia instead uses her ultimate to create man advantage, support her team, and find advantageous skirmishes and fights around the map. She does really well when comboing off of champions with CC and has a ton of tool to shut down engages and turnaround fights. For these reasons, I really like to be able to pair Talia with strong carry junglers such as Viego, Belveth, or Lee Sin. That doesn't mean Talia can't work without champions to set her up. She definitely has a lot of ability to make plays on her own and create the setup for her team. It just requires more creativity and reliance on execution. Now, with all that being said, there are some weaknesses of Talia that we need to keep in mind. The first is that she has fairly short range, and that means that she will struggle into things that outrange her. If you have played Cassiopeia before, you'll find a lot of similarities there. Things like Zerath, Lux, Ziggs, or late game Jace and Victor can all feel like impossible to deal with at times. She also can struggle quite a lot against multi-threat, especially champions that can get onto her easily without dashing. Katarina, Zed, Fizz, and other similar assassins all pose a strong threat. Now there are a lot of different rune setups you can go on Talia. I'm going to start with what I have preferred to go most uh, recently, which is the Electric Youth setup. I think this setup is just so powerful. It gives you a ton of lane presence, especially with uh, comboing it with the Scorch. You can really catch people off guard and it, they just don't expect the strong early presence from Talia. Now this has been my preferred page just because I like playing that aggressive lane style and you'll see that a lot in the clips that we go by, but this is by no means the runes that you have to run on Talia. Like I said, there are many different options, but this is definitely what I would go uh, with this page. I don't really see a huge amount of variation except maybe if you want to go ingenious hunter uh, and kind of you you can you can play around with that i know uh, odysseus and eu likes to go with that but i think the treasure hunter just makes sense ultimate hunter you don't really need it um uh, but one thing i will mention is you don't actually need mana in your runes uh, i don't think you need it as long as you get your tier on your first base, base which is what i will always do and you also don't need the attack speed having this ap um instead of the attack speed actually gets you a lot of uh, extra damage on the wave it's it saves like basically one of your rocks early on that helps you clear the casters um and it just makes a lot more sense so this is the rune setup that i would always go uh going through that electric cube all right, now with this second setup here, I have the phase rush. And I think that this is a very strong setup. I did play quite a bit of it in the last season. I've just mostly been opting for that electrocute instead. So I've kind of replaced this page, but this is a very strong page. If you need that move speed uh, to kite out opponents or take good trades in lane, this is going to be really powerful. So I liked running it into stuff like Orianna, Syndra, Victor, these difficult uh, mage matchups because it really gives you a lot of trade power or things like Yone or Akali. It lets you kite them out and really get a good trade on the back end. So opting for that phase rush, this is where you can take the mana flow just because no other runes really make sense. If, if you could go nullifying orb, definitely if it's a good lane for it, but we might as well just go for the extra mana and, and just really use that in lane. And then I personally, once again, like the scorch, you can go gathering storm if you really want to, and you want to just like, you know, scale it up, but just having scorch in your lanes really just makes that much of a difference that uh, it, it gets you through the lanes a whole lot easier. Um, as far as the secondary goes, I think inspiration with the with the DMAT and the Cosmic Insight is just the easiest and uh, most simple combo. You can maybe go for the boots instead. Um, and if you want to swap one of these outs, like you don't technically don't need the DMATs. Uh, DMATs are just very nice because it helps you shove so quickly. It can get cannon waves in really fast and it helps you just get those breakpoints when you get the level 7 level 9. This is definitely a very valuable page if you need that move speed and you like kind of playing that in and out style. Now, one thing I will bring up is the Comet and the Airy options. Now, if I'm going to be honest, I don't like these setups. If you want lane presence, just opt in for that Electrocute instead. I think it gives you way more value in the lane as Talia. Now, my reasoning behind this is if we think about people who like to use Airy and Comet, these are going to be poke mages like Syndra and Victor and Orianna. If we just imagine a Victor, Victor is very good at landing these max range E's, trading these Q's uh, onto the enemy, proccing that area or that Comet very frequently. 
Now, Talia doesn't really do that. She uses her Qs on the wave to get wave dominance, and she can't really decide between champion and wave a lot of the time until she gets a wave advantage. Then she can really use that to pressure the enemy. I think that Talia thrives much more when she gets a good burst combo. If you're able to land a WE or an auto E, auto Q, these kind of things really just amplify her short trade and let her use that wave advantage in the way that she wants. So I think that these setups are okay. You can experiment with them, but personally, I found Electrocute just makes way more sense. All right, and for the final setup here, we have the First Strike page. First Strike complements Talia very well. It gives you a lot of scaling power. Once you hit that mid to late game, this is going to be doing a ton of damage. Of course, the trade-off here is that Electrocute gives you that early presence, whereas First Strike is not going to have that same uh, presence in the lane. But of course, you can go the setup where you don't need that presence in lane. For example, if the lanes just look like it's not going to have a lot of kill thread or trading back and forth, or maybe it's a tank matchup like Cassante or Zac or something similar to that. So with that, I don't think there's a lot of other options except for these three runes here with the Boots, Dima, and the Cosmic Insight. Um, I'll, over here in the Sorcery Tree, though, I think this is where you might want to consider Gathering Storm, especially if you don't feel like this Scorch is going to do anything for you in the lane. And if you're running a First Strike setup, I think that probably you would be considering this anyway. So definitely look into this Gathering Storm with this page. This is definitely a good scaling setup, but it's going to be a little bit less presence in lane. All right, so getting into the items here. Now, with Season 14 around, there are just so many different build paths you can go, and they all are actually quite viable because of how unique the items are and how they can adapt to each situation. So I don't want to pigeonhole you too hard, but I want to give you a few build paths that I think are generally consistent and will give you a lot of variety still. And then as you get used to those builds and get better at Talia, you can kind of adapt and be a little bit more nuanced with your build paths. So let's get into those, some of those standard builds to start. So in the early game, I will always start with a Doran's Ring. This is because you need the AP to be able to clear the wave. Tier just doesn't allow you to have that. And you won't be doing any damage to the wave. It's going to be really difficult. And the extra mana you're going to get is just not worth it. For this reason, I will always buy a Doran's Ring. And then I'll go instantly into the tier every single time on my first base, no matter what. And this is, of course, because I like building that Seraphs. Some people, they don't think that they need the tier. But of course, you need mana in your runes for this, which I don't take. And you'll need to kind of get really used to not having that bonus mana from the tier and building the Ludens instead of something like that so it's viable but not something i've experimented with and i think the tier just makes it easy for talia now after that base for this tier, i'll usually be basing around 800 to 1100 gold so i'll pick up an amto and maybe tier one boots if i can and start building towards my lost chapter and my ionian boots now i have been experimenting a lot more with just picking up the straight ionian boots after i build the tier and I have liked it generally. You definitely have obviously less mana than if you were to get a mana crystal or a lost chapter early on. But the tier two movement speed is very nice against some of these mage matchups. And it helps you like really dish out the damage on the way fast if you need to. Now I think the much easier option is just to go straight into the lost chapter. Maybe picking up a tier one boots if you need it. But the lost chapter just kind of gives you everything you need to be able to reach those wave clear breakpoints as Talia. That gives you the AP and the mana. So you don't really have to stress too much about it. And then I could just pick up a Ionia Boots later on. I think that this is probably the easiest build to execute. Just Lost Chapter and then pick up those Tier 2 Boots. Now alongside that we have Dark Seal. I'm personally not the biggest fan of Dark Seal. I just don't really often see myself buying it. I think it's better to just save the money and you know spend it towards something else that's probably going to get me an earlier spike. Now that being said, there are some people that do like it. And I have built it a couple of times. But generally, it's just not for me. Now the other boot option we have is the Sorks. I've generally opted for the Ionian boost just because they are so cheap and they can give you that early on spike. And I think that it just feels much better to play with. But I was building Sorks a lot at the beginning of the season and I see a lot of value in them. Especially if you want to just go a very high heavy burst style, you can kind of go something into like the Sorks, into the Shadow Flame and just really dish out a lot of damage. But this really cuts your CDR back quite a lot. And it's just a different play style of Talia. So that's something to keep in mind. I generally just have preferred the Ionian boots, but don't be afraid to experiment and just kind of go with what feels best to you. Now, of course, the first item is going to be the Seraphs. A lot of people have talked about maybe going Lost Chapter into a different item like Cosmic Drive or Leandres or whatever it is. I think it's just easier and more consistent to just build straight into the Seraphs. This is what I see most people doing. You get the shield very early on, you get that tier stacked up and you get a lot of mana. And I think it's just overall a good item to have. So everything in the early game, I build pretty consistently on any build, no matter what. I don't deviate too much. But getting into the second items, this is where all the variation really starts to take play. So the first build that I've been going most often in this season is the Shadow Flame second. Now, I know a lot of people don't like this item, but it synergizes really well with the Electrocute, and especially if you're against Squishy, you can completely burst them in a single combo. Generally, after the Shadow Flame, I like to go into something with the Rabadons, just go very, very high AP, and then just really play for that three-item spike and completely destroy teamfights from there. 
Now, of course, this build doesn't offer a lot of CDR, which is why I generally like at least the Ionian boots because it gives me that little bit. The only thing is maybe you're missing out on the bonus magic pen from the Sorks, but I don't really see it as too much of an issue. If you're playing against Squishies, I think the Ionian boots is totally fine and then just going into the Shadow Flame. Now, after you pick up that Rabadon's third, you have a ton of different options. It really just depends on what the game state calls for. If you're up against Magic Resist, opting in for the Void or the Crypto Bloom is totally fine. I'll talk about the differences in those items and when to build each in just a second, but you can also build into the Cosmic Drive if you feel like you just need the CDR or if you need some defensive abilities going into the Zanyas or the Banshee Vels is totally fine or maybe if they're stacking HP Leandres. After these first three items it really just is a pick and choose your own adventure type of thing so don't be afraid to try out a bunch of different items and see what feels good. All right so getting into the second build path here that is going to be going straight into the Cosmic Drive as your second item. Now of course Shadow Flame offers a lot of bursts against squishies but if you're not against squishies and you're more against frontline so say things that are liking to dash onto you or trying to get on top of you in a team fight Cosmic Drive is really nice because it offers so much CDR and kind ability that it can make it much more difficult for people who are diving onto you in those team fights. It offers a ton of utility for your team. You can get that E cooldown up way, way faster. So it feels really good on Talia overall. And if you can even pick it up as a later item in some of your other builds, it's a great item. Now, after the Cosmic Drive, I'll generally like to go into the Rabadons once again. Now, I do think Rabadons is the best third item on Talia, basically no matter what you're playing. I think Talia just thrives on having a lot of AP, and this is where generally your damage is going to be coming from. So if you can pick up the Rabadons third, definitely go for it. If not, you have a lot of other options instead. If you need defensive, you can go for the Zanyas and the Banshees. If you feel like they're building MR early, you can go for a pen item, or of course, Leandre's if you feel like there's a lot of HP you're getting through. I would generally stay away from going Shadow Flame if it's not your second item. The flat pen just doesn't really offer a lot as you get later and later into the game. It's much better to just pick up a pen item with a Rabadons. All right, so getting into the third standard build here, I have the Leandre's second. Now, this is an item that I wasn't very often building at all, but I see a lot of more people building it second, and I've tried it out, and I've been playing it a lot recently, and it does feel quite nice if you know you're against champions that have high HP, so maybe a couple tanks and a bruiser, or a couple bruisers, or whatever. I think it generally can be a good second option. Of course, once again, going into that Rabadon's third, and then just kind of picking your own adventure with whatever other item you need in the game. But definitely give this item a try. Of course, Cosmic Drive is always an option if you're against a lot of frontline, but the Leandries gives a little bit of a different feel. Say there's not a lot of people who are trying to use dashes to get on top of you in the game, then that would mean Cosmic Drive kind of loses a little bit more value, and you can actually just kind of do more damage with the Leandries output. So I definitely give it a shot, and then of course just fill in whatever item you need after that. Now to talk about the difference of Void and Crypto Bloom, I was originally kind of in the camp of like Crypto Bloom is not very good, and Void Staff is just kind of better overall, especially if you need to be the DPS in the team, the one that's actually doing damage. Definitely just opt into the Void, it gives that much more carry style. That being said, I've been building Crypto Bloom quite a lot recently, and I do see the strength in it. Obviously, it gives you the CDR, which is very nice. So you can kind of build it early on, and it acts as a little bit of a substitute for something like a Cosmic Drive if you're not building that on early. And it gives you the pen still, so you can get a lot of value out of it, especially in the early skirmishes when you can pop that passive. All right, so getting into some of the build variations, we have a lot of different options. So something I have been trying a little bit is Crypto Bloom as a second item if they're early stacking MR. The enemies aren't often going to have a whole lot of magic resist early on in the game, but it also gives you CDR, so you don't get to build something like Cosmic Drive, obviously, if you're going into Crypto Bloom second. So it just gives a little bit of oomph to your spells there. Of course, after that just something into like Rabadon's Cosmic Drive, Leandre's, whatever it may be. Now I also have tried the defensive items first, the Banshees and the Zanyas, and I think these are actually great options for Talia second. Because they give just as much AP as you would with the Shadow Flame, you can kind of just build into the Rabadon's after that, and you're still generally going to get that same AP value. So quite good if you feel like you need that resistance or that defensive capability early on. Especially if you're ahead, it just makes it way more difficult for you to die and lose that shutdown. All right, so I think that's pretty much it for all of the build variation. You can see that there's so much flexibility in the items right now, but if you want to stick to something standard, I'd go maybe a Shadow Flame into a Rabadons to start, maybe a Cosmic Drive into Rabadons, Leandre's into Rabadons. I think that these are like very, very clear paths that give you a huge spike on that level three and give you a lot of adaptability depending on what the game is asking for. But as you get more used to Talia and her damage, you can go into a bunch of different stuff early on, like the Crypto Bloom or the defensive items. All right, so quickly to talk about the summoners, Flash is basically a given. I don't see any other way that you're not going to be taking Flash on Talia. Past that, I think TP is just the best second spell for you. I think it just makes a ton of sense. It's great for mages, especially early on when you need to get that base for a tier or an Amptom or whatever it may be. You can TP back into the lane and help reset your mana pool. And it can also help you really pressure lanes in which you already have a winning advantage. TP overall is just probably the best summoner secondary for most mages and mid laners in general. Past that, you can maybe consider Ignite. That's probably the only other summoner I would really go nowadays. If you're into like a melee matchup that if they all in you, you're going to completely mess them up, especially with something like an Electrocute setup. I could see it. 
But if you're not going electrocute and you're not playing aggressive early in lane and you're not really against a melee champion, I would not be running this spell. The only other contender is really Ghost. And while Ghost was like very good back a couple seasons ago, at this point, it's just really kind of outclassed by the other summoner spells. And unless you're like into a tank matchup where you are guaranteed to get good resets, I wouldn't really consider this rune all that much because it's just hyperscaling and it just doesn't really give you a lot of options in the mid game. It kind of forces you to not be able to side lane as well. So I would just stick with Flash and TP for the most part. Part. All right, so hopping into the laning now with the matchup tier list. I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on the actual tier list. I want to get more into the examples. I think they'll help a lot more. But I do just want to outline some of the lanes that are very difficult, how you can help mitigate them, or how you can abuse lanes that are good. So first of all, these matchups down here with the mages are going to be probably your most difficult matchups. It's just really difficult to actually fight them. You're never going to out-trade them if they're spacing properly and playing around the minions. So you really have to abuse that wave clear in some of them. But for example, Zoe is not going to really care if you're pushing the wave against her because she's going to just run past the minions. And if she lands a bubble, you're pretty much cooked. So these matchups here with the mages are definitely some of your hardest ones. And you really have to find ways to maneuver, dodge their poke, and, and get the wave in so you can actually find roams and, and get out of the lane. As far as Rumble and Zerath go, Zerath is just like difficult to deal with, especially as he goes later into the game. I would just basically just try and shove as much as possible and try to influence the rest of the map. And then Rumble is just difficult because you can't really poke him out or trade onto him, but also he kind of has the ability to just tank the wave and, and push before you. And if you're ever caught by him, it's going to be really tough. He can just flash on top of you. So, so something that may cause you issues. So getting into the not so easy matchups, some of these lane bullies are things that you can kind of just CC you and is not really easy for you to deal with. Uh, stuff that's just going to outtrade you if it gets on top of you. Vigar is an issue only depending on the jungle matchup because he has the ability to lock you down. But if you don't really have an issue of their jungler being high threat, you can kind of just dip the lane and I wouldn't worry too much about it. And then some of these assassins uh, that don't actually have a lot of dashes or something like a Trinomir that doesn't really care if um, you get dashed on is going to be quite annoying for you because you don't really have a lot of safety and ability to prevent them. So once they hit like their level six and they're all in spikes, you're going to have to make sure that you build up a lead before then or else you're going to be in a bad position. All right, so getting into the, some of the skill matchups, Cassiopeia, Vex, Ari, LeBlanc, all like kind of mages that want to trade onto you. But if you're playing properly and spacing correctly, I think you should just be fine. And then these 80 champions here, all these assassins are okay to deal with and you'll shut them down really hard in team fights. But it's not necessarily so easy, if, especially if you mess up your wave clear and they can actually hold it. You're going to be in a not good position. So you need to make sure you're playing your waves very, very well against these champions. And as far as Tristana goes, as long as you're using your E when she dashes in, you should be totally fine and you should out trade her. All right, so getting into some of the skill winning matchups, Azir, you should be shoving the way pretty hard against him. And if you're able to do that, then you should be in a good position to be winning. Katarina becomes tricky, especially in the skirmishes. In lane, she's not too much of a threat if you're spacing properly, but in the skirmishes, you don't actually have hard CC to lock her down. She can kind of just shun Poe past her E, so that's what makes it difficult there. And as far as Silas goes, once again, if you don't get hit by the chains, then you should be just fine. But if you get hit by the chains at basically any point and you don't properly buffer your E to make sure he gets stunned, you're not going to be in a good position. Pantheon is probably, I would put him in the easy tier as long as you're spacing properly. Pantheon is basically just a noob killer where if he ever gets on you, you're going to be hurting, but you should be able to space it just fine. And a lot of these easy matchups are basically just champions that don't really have any threat onto you and you can pretty much shove the wave or do whatever you want and harass them just freely. All right, getting into the lanes here, we're going to start with Mage versus Mage. In this matchup, we have Azir versus Talia. Now, both of these champions really thrive by getting wave advantage and getting wave control and using that to trade with their enemy advantageously. And this really shows the power of not only electrocute in these lanes, but also getting the power, getting using the Q power to push in the wave and really bully out this Azir. So you'll notice as soon as I get the wave, I am autoing and I'm throwing Qs. Getting that Q onto the back line is super essential for stacking up your early damage. And you'll see I kind of transition over to the other side and then throw another Q here. Now, there's basically no champion in the game uh, that plays in mid lane that can really contest you on this push. And you can see how quickly it is. I can kind of just walk up in his face, land those extra Qs while he's trying to CS. And then once again, as soon as this wave comes in, I'm going to start doing the same thing. Of course, he gets a level 2 advantage because of his ward early on, which is okay. He uses his, uh, his Q up there, so I'm going to immediately start walking up. And look, I use that Q on the back line again once again, and then I instantly get in his face. And this is exactly the position you want to be in, Talia. You can't actually Q through the minions here because... Well, they're going to get stopped by the minions, so you kind of just get really locked in if you stay here. But using this level 2 advantage with the electrocute to walk up past the minions, that's where you gain that advantage. And you can only really do that if the minions get low. 
if the minis are full HP, then he can kind of use those to, you know, to his his advantage, try to get a trade on the back end. But since they're so low, I can really kill them at any time with my AoE. So it makes it very difficult for him to trade. So I throw in that auto E auto Q. And I use that Q after I get that E slow to really guarantee that I'm able to land it. And then from here, the lane is just really difficult for Azir to play. I've already got such an advantage with my, uh, with those first two levels that I can basically just take over the game. All right, so for this second lane, I have a Talia versus TF. Now, something I really want to showcase specifically uh, early on is I like to get this ward uh, early, about one at the 105, 110 mark, just to be able to make sure I have the ward out early and I continu can continue pushing the waves without too much threat from jungle. So this is what I like to do early on, get that ward out uh, initially, and then I can use that to really play the lane much more simply. So. Once again, you're going to see I'm going to have the same lane uh, power. So I walk up. I instantly going to start autoing these melees as soon as possible, which technically I am a little late. I can get there earlier. But then once again, throwing that Q onto the back line, making it as difficult as possible for uh, TF to try and match my shove. So I throw that one out first. You'll see this time I actually throw the big Q onto the back line just because of the way I was positioned in the lane. But then here we are. We got that minion advantage and we land a really solid Q with that Scorch to push him off back uh, back to his tower. And this gives us the easy hit to start off with these melees as well. So just building up that minion advantage once again. I do a little bit of a sloppy Q there. All good. But then here we are getting that electric proc. And this is like the struggle of Talia, right? You see I very much so couldn't get past the minions here. And I kind of just throw my minions or my throw throw my Q into the minions, which doesn't really do much for me, but I'm still able to get that electric Q proc and it does a lot of damage to him. Brings him to decently low HP. And once again, I have this minion advantage. So I walk up and I'm able to land that big Q, get a really solid bit of poke there. And then once again, walking past these minions to get that Q range. From here, I can just continue poking him under tower. This is what Celia does so well, especially with this uh, electrocute setup. So we found ourselves in this position where TF is a whole lot lower than me, and I still have two pots ready. And I can really just abuse this uh, the the lead I've gotten earlier to just play the waves completely normal. At this point, I'm actually wanting the waves to stay even or maybe even slightly come into me just because it puts so much threat onto him. I unfortunately missed a combo. I probably could have burned a flash there if I did hit it. But even then, you can see how much pressure he's under. He's forced to just kind of throw things at me, and none of it's really working for him. And then once again, walking past the wave, this is why it's so important to get out of the minion so you can use your Q effectively on the enemy. And you can see, after that trade, it's basically just done for him. He has to go to base, and we have ourselves a very solid reset to start off the game. All right, now getting into the melee matchups and some of the assassins, we have Talia versus Zed. Now, Zed has gone for a very aggressive setup with the Electrocute and the Ignite, but we can definitely see how we can use Talia's pushing power to really counteract that and get a good uh, lane state despite it. So once again, my my hypothesis is gonna be the same. I'm gonna look for shoves, use that wave advantage to get poke onto the Zed uh, more effectively. So start autoing as soon as possible. You see Zed tries to match a little bit, um, but I dodge out on the Qs, get a good nice Q uh, onto these backline minions here to soften them up. And then I'll go for this Q here looking something you'll notice is I try to line up my Q here with the minions so that when it does actually push through these minions it's gonna hit the Zed here uh, unfortunately he does get out of range quick enough so you know all good we did get the wave shove at least we actually do get the early level too which is nice but I can use this time to really just put the Zed under a whole lot of hurt and he can't actually collect those casters very easily he's gonna miss out on quite a bit of CS and once again we're gonna do the same thing for this this second wave here I think I could have been a little bit more aggressive here. I think this was a little bit of a mistake. I could have walked up, gotten an auto E auto. Uh, that's definitely the best combo for that electric cube rock. And I think I missed that timer just a little bit because I was uh, unaware of uh, my advantage there. So going to get the second wave in. Unfortunately, I do have to go and check because it's possible that there was an invade on the spot side and I definitely wanted to spot it out in case uh, they were invading. So look, it turns out it wasn't. And I'm going to play a little bit passive here. Now, this is... This is the reason I'm being passive here in this exact moment, just because I'm kind of unaware of jungler and Zed is going to be hitting his level three spike spike. And I kind of lost that priority on the wave. And I actually don't want to be pushing here. It's too difficult for me to be pushing up and also be safe from Viego or like a Zed W E Q combo. Uh, it just gets very difficult. So playing a little bit passive on this exact timer here and keeping the wave in a more neutral state. Unfortunately, I get kind of 
uh, slammed by that combo, but it's okay. It's only one combo. We can definitely recover from that. So once again, just playing these waves nice and nice and neutral, just not, you know, rushing anything. And I know his combo is down and the scan is going to be up. So what do I do? I instantly walk up get those AOE Qs onto him. And that's a huge trade that will uh, definitely stabilize this lane quite a lot. He's going to be getting his combo back up just in here in a little bit. So once again, nice and nice and chill. And this is exactly what we what we like to see. So we we punish him because he walked up outside of his minions trying to get this combo and it was very clear. So I walk up and I'm ready to punish him. So I juke out on the cues by walking forward into him. And then from here, I can kind of just chase him down. I get a nice little Q flash auto to finish him off. And this is the kind of damage that you really need to be maximizing uh, in these lanes. If you if you really want to play super aggressive, just landing that Q flash auto can get you a, a huge amount of burst and people don't expect it. And that's a very clean start for us in this lane. All right, so rocking up for our next matchup, we have a Talia versus Echo. Now, Echo has gone for, once again, the aggressive setup with the Ignite. And this lane definitely showcases why it's so important to really know and tether that range properly against these melee matchups. So you'll see, once again, I'm going to generally have the same sort of thing. I get that early ward out so I can really punish. And this is uh, more difficult to just instantly start hitting the wave against this Echo because, of course, he has the E and the Hail of Blaze to trade on top of me. I think I missed tether just a little bit. But this is okay because this is what Electrocute Escorch kind of allows you to do is like get a decent trade even if the, the, these melees get onto you. So not the greatest trade by me, going to be honest, but it's okay. I am going to easily get the wave advantage though just because he doesn't have uh, doesn't have the Q. So I tether that E range once again and I get this wave shoved in. With how these minions are stacking up, I'm definitely going to get a level 2 advantage really easily here. So going to walk up. Looking for that E. If I can't get the auto E auto, I'm not going to throw out my E here. I, I definitely want to get that electrocute proc with it or save it for a better time. Maybe when he does engage onto me. Nice little big Q that I wove through that minion there to AOE him. Something that definitely you want to look out for and proc another Scorch. And this is the timer that I really like. I know exactly that I can play safely towards the spot side. So I use that timer to really bully him under the tower when he didn't get his uh, level two very early on. And now in this wave, I'm going to play it nice and passive. I'm not going to start shoving it again like the, the previous ones. I'm just going to sit here, auto last hit and try to poke him whenever I can. So a, Q, a few cues there. And then once again, tethering that range, making sure that I'm out of his E at all times. And for the next, uh, you know, eight seconds or whatever it is, I can really just put the hurt on him. So there we go. Land a huge combo, get that electrocute. And now he's going to have a really tough time trying to engage at all because I might just turn around and kill him instantly. Wave is stacking up. I'm actually totally fine to start shoving here, but I'll still keep the wave just a little bit even. Hey, he's, he's, he's forced to just use abilities to stay back. Now, of course, I don't have any vision on jungler or... Uh, information and I'm getting a little bit low mana so I think that in this situation I'm going to play a little bit more back and keep the wave kind of passive. So he throws that W out early trying to get the shove onto the minions because he definitely wants to get that base in and he doesn't have TP for it so what do I do? I instantly start walking up. He uses Q, he uses W so here I am past the minion wave really just zoning him off of any possibility of getting to these to this wave and, and poking him out. He's forced to use his abilities to dodge out instead of trade onto me. And then once again, I walk up, I find a nice little flick there. And we should just be able to finish this echo off with following on the flash and just like that. And I think that this is really the power of Electric Q. Uh, Talia wants these burst trades. And just, you know, when you land that QE and get those Qs to follow up past the wave, that's exactly where you find these huge advantages. All right, so getting into the skirmishing and team fighting as Talia, I think there are four main things that you should be thinking about. The first is objectives. The second is Fog of War. The third is playing off of CC. And the fourth is R usage. Now, all these have a lot of nuance into how you use them and how you think about them. So I'm going to get into a bunch of clips here that really highlight each of them. And hopefully I can show you my mindset when it comes to these fights. All right, so getting into this first clip here, I think it really shows the importance of playing around objectives as Talia. Now, most control mages like to get to objectives early. They can get vision for their team and control it. They can play for picks and make sure that they hold the chokes correctly. Now, Talia amplifies this by a ton because her pick and her control is so good in these chokes. So making sure that you get to the objective first and help your team get that is super valuable and important. So we can see in this game, we have Dragon coming up in 54 seconds. We have a very strong jungler. 
Um, currently, I don't have a lot of support for my team since everyone's kind of in base. Renekton's moving to top. And of course, Ziggs is clearing mid, so I don't really have an opportunity to shove bot because of the position of the wave. And is, I'm just way vulnerable from either Akali engaging on me solo or Maokai uh, looking to collapse on me. So what I'm actually going to do is just basically sit mid and see if I can control any of the vision. I basically just want to make it as difficult as possible for the enemy team to get any vision and maybe chunk somebody out if they decide to face check. So finally, my Alistar has gotten here. I'm just waiting on my top laner and my jungler now. Probably just my jungler top lane can, is totally fine to split. So you can see I kind of just sit in the fog of war and I'm waiting for something to happen. But you can see no matter what, I'm still just waiting for my Viego. And as soon as we find somebody striking the Fog of War, we find the pick and I play off that CC and we're able to find a beautiful pick off of it and basically just win the team fight from there. Now, I hope this shows the importance of getting to objectives first, but also abusing that Fog of War and playing off CC and being patient with your abilities until that moment comes. All right, so getting into this second clip here, I want to really highlight the importance of Fog of War control. So in this game, we are fighting over the grubs at about five minutes, and this is actually a 4v4 with both supports coming up. So what I'm trying to do is kind of weave my way in and find an angle to regroup with my team. And you'll see this is exactly where the fog of war usage comes in. I get into this bush and I'm very patient. So I wait, I wait, and I find the opportunity and I get that double flick off. Now, there are actually two key elements here. First is getting into the bush and using the fog of war, but also being patient with my abilities. I could have thrown it plenty of time between now but i wait for them to walk up very deep into it and i can find that opportunity when they're already trying to think about how to dodge it or get into the grubs so i hope that really highlights the importance of using that fog of war cilia to make it easier to land your combo all right so getting into this next clip here i really want to highlight the importance of playing off cc especially when it comes to finding priority targets so in this game, it's clear that there is one very clear priority target, and that is Ezreal. He's got a 450 gold shutdown on him. He's definitely the strongest member out of anyone. And I have a great form of CC in my Volley Bear. So if ever there's an opportunity where Volley Bear finds a CC, and it doesn't necessarily need to be on Ezreal, but it can be on really any of these uh, targets here, I'm going to make sure that I'm ready to combo off of it, but especially if that Ezreal ever finds himself caught off guard. So team is ending up uh, going towards mid. I don't... I see kind of maybe something's happening, so I make sure to run to follow up with my team because Talia loves to play off of her team in this way. Looking for an ultimate, I don't really see an angle for it. But then as soon as Ezra E ends, my Volley Bear finds a great angle and I clip him with that WE because I'm ready to hit him as soon as possible. And these are really the moments that you need to be finding as Talia. Remember, keeping that priority target in mind so that if there's ever an opportunity where they're comboed off CC, you can look for that and find a successful skirmish. All right, so now I want to get into some of the R usage when it comes to Talia in the mid game and these team fights and skirmishes. Now, the first obvious use of Talia R in the mid game is using it to make plays mid after you have shoved a side lane. So, of course, Talia doesn't like to be stuck in the side lane as most control mages are not too keen about. So, in this game, we are up against a smolder in the side lane. And, of course, we're on the opposite side of the map of the fighting, which is not great. I do have TP coming up soon, but I do have R available as well. So, you see exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to shove and I'm going to look to get to mid lane. I see Jin is maybe overextended, probably not. I, I don't know if I can find anything here, but I'm not going to do anything useful sitting side lane. So Zach makes the engage and immediately I'm going to pull the trigger. I'm going to find my R. I think I misplayed this a little bit. I jumped off a little too late and it makes it. So I take a lot of extra damage, but you can see the importance of, especially when you hit this level 11 and your ult becomes much longer. It's all about shoving faster than your opponent and moving into mid lane. In this situation, I don't even know necessarily that an engage is going to happen. But I'm just going to hover around and see if I can find ult. If not, I'll go back to bot lane. But in this situation, I find a pick because Zach engages a little too preemptively. And we're able to find a great kill off of it. Alright, so getting more into the ultimate usage as Talia. So in this situation, I just finished pushing up top. And we have Dragon coming up soon. So of course, I'm going to reset. And I'm going to run to bot side here to try and help my team find a pick. Now in this clip, I think it's very important to note the importance of using R to pull the trigger. Now you can see I move my way towards bot side. There's maybe some fighting happening on uh, on bot with the Shen and the Rek'Sai. Now you can see the situation. My entire team is collapsing. So I see this as a great opportunity to use ult to make sure I can get in and dive with my team as soon as possible. Especially comboing off Jarvan is amazing here. Now something to note in this clip is possibly griefing your team from your R usage by cutting them off from the fight. So in this situation, you can see I actually cut off the Shen in this situation. I see it as a worth play for me because i get into the play fast and i think that me and jarvin can do it fine plus shen does have a dash technically to get into the fight it's not great for him to use it over the wall instead of on somebody 
But the way I see it, this fight is going to happen fast enough that if I just pull the trigger instantly with my ultimate, then it'll work out. But there's a lot of situations where if you're not paying attention to your R usage, you're going to cut off your team and it's going to make it way more difficult for them to fight. Or you can actually just CC them and knock them away and it just becomes super messy. So pay attention to your teammate's location and make sure you're factoring them in to when you're using your R. Now, another example of using ult in fights in the mid game is using it to cut the enemy off. So in this situation, I'm moving up towards topside just because they took the dragon. I have no way really to access the bot lane. So I'm just going to see move to topside. Maybe I can help Yone. Maybe I can get a camp, whatever it may be. But you can see Nunu is actually rolling into mid lane. And so I use this opportunity to ult and try to cut him off. And I am able to do that because his entire team is just stuck behind the wall. So it makes it really easy for us to find the pick. Unfortunately, I missed my W, but it ends up just fine. We were able to get the kill and uh, just do it because, well, he got two over eager. And this is very similar to that Zac play where I was able to cut the Zac when he dove in this way. And using that when tanks dive in and just protecting your team is a huge way where you can find man advantages just by cutting people off because it makes it so their, their backline can't actually do damage over the wall a lot of the time. All right, so getting into one more clip here, this is going to be highlighting our uses to cut off people in the team fight, but in a much more chaotic environment. So you can see, I kind of have set myself up around mid. We're playing and controlling the vision around the Baron. So I want to collect this mid wave and I can just continue to go back and find the CC with my team. So I combo off of it. Unfortunately, the Darius had flash, all good. I'll just make sure to DPS and keep my um, distance from him. And you can see actually Aurelia dives in and finds the Sivir, which is a huge start to the fight for us. So I'm pinging onto my way to the Baron, but then I see that they are actually diving deep into here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my ultimate to cut off this fight. And you can see now this Aurelian soul and the Hui is actually back here. They are just completely unable to enter the fight. Yeah, maybe Hui can throw some abilities and Aurelian soul can queue from here. But realistically, these guys are completely separated it and it gives us a very clear target for my team. So we end up just being able to get in and uh, just completely cut off the team. I find a flick on the Darius. And this is a huge team fight win for us. And it just makes it way easier when the team, when the rest of the team is cut off with that arm. Now, one thing I want to mention about using ults in team fights is you are going to fuck this up. You're going to fuck this up a lot. Like I have made so many mistakes. I have ulted my team in the wrong position. I've ulted and not cut any people off at all. I've ulted and got myself into really bad scenarios. It's just a very high skill cap thing that you have to just try and try again until you see the right scenarios so you're able to use your ult correctly. Like in this scenario, I could have very easily like cut my team and, and knocked them both my Vi and my Orn into an awkward position and made it more difficult for them to fight. Fortunately, they are able to dodge out on it with the Q and the, and the Orn W, but there's a lot of scenarios where I mess that up and I knock my team and it just makes the fight actually turn out bad. So when you're learning Talia, don't be afraid to just throw your ultimate in a fight and just see how it works. Like, I mean, of course, try to throw it with intention, try to cut people off. And one thing that I really like to do is find creative angles around the dragon to try and cut off the enemy from this angle or maybe do it from the same from this angle. And those type of plays really just come with time and experience. And you just have to be willing to fail and throw your ultimate in bad situations that will lose you fights. One of the more advanced tricks that you can do with Talia is holding the level up for your ultimate. This is because the way Talia ult works is that you can't cast it while you're in combat. It'll go on a three second cooldown every time you take damage. The ultimate doesn't actually get on cooldown until you take damage when it's leveled up. So what you can do is instantly level it up and then cast it to be able to get yourself out of sticky situations. This definitely takes some getting used to, but it's super nice because I have had times where I've messed up and made a mistake and I'm able to use my ult to get out of those. I don't know if it was Odysseus that invented this, but he's the person I learned it from. So credit to him for figuring this one out. So talking about Talia's wave clear, a mistake I see a lot of people make is as soon as the wave starts coming, they will begin throwing cues at the front of the wave and then they'll go at it and then, you know, try to clear. And this is okay. Yeah, it gets the wave pushed in for sure, but it's a little inefficient and it will cost you a lot of mana. The reason it's so inefficient is because you're throwing cues, multiple cues to hit a single target, the front melee minion. So instead, a much better approach to go to save mana and make sure that you're killing the wave as fast as possible is to auto at the beginning and then throw your E, W, and as soon as the wave is stacked up, you can queue it through there. This gets me out with a lot less mana spent and it doesn't really cost you any time either. Now you will sometimes see me start with Q, but I'll try to spread my damage. So I'll stand on the outside of the wave and make sure that I hit at least two of the casters before this. And then usually I'll just wave to throw my QE to make sure I can clear the whole wave like that. Now another trap that people fall into with Talia's wave clear is thinking that they have to throw the minions backwards. The thing is, throwing the melees into the casters is nice because it makes sense you're doing extra damage to the, ca the melees instead of the casters and you can clear fine like that. The problem is it puts you in a much more vulnerable position. Having to clear the wave up here rather than in the middle of the lane 
So just for comparison, this is what it looks like when you clear the wave, when you start uh, pulling the casters towards you. Now, the only time this makes a big difference is when there is a cannon wave. Because if the way the cannon stacks up is improper, it can be really annoying and actually ends up blocking all of your minions. So, of course, we want to hit the cannon with our E, but this means it blocks all of our Qs, which we can't actually hit the casters with. So this becomes a bit of an issue. And, and just for comparison, you can see when I throw the cannon backwards with the melees, it's going to make it a lot easier to DPS the entire wave because the cannon doesn't end up blocking anything. Now, of course, we still run into the same issues where we are much more vulnerable if we throw the melees and the cannon back. So what you can actually do is try to line up your W as to not hit the cannon. This means that you can still hit all the casters. They end up coming forward and you can do damage all to them. And then you just have to end up killing the cannon after. Of course, it doesn't get the damage on the E, but you should be fine. The final thing I want to mention about wave clear is you don't need your E to clear the wave. If you're in a spot where you're going to get ganked or you're super vulnerable to the enemy laner, if you don't have your E, then you don't need to use it. Just make sure that you get AOE Qs, high quality Qs, on everything else and you'll be fine that will be a fine wave clear it's a little slower yeah sure but if you need to save your e to prevent a gank then it's going to be way worth it so make sure to keep this in mind if you're getting ganked when your e is down this might be the reason so regarding ability use something i want to mention is it's not very easy to land a raw dog we combo it's just very very difficult you have to line it up there's a lot of time where the enemy can react to your w being down so it makes it very difficult Instead, a great way to set up for your WE is to land your big Q. This slows for a super long time, so you're able to combo that and then throw your WE when they are hit by that. Now, something else you can do is throw your E and wait for your W. Just wait a couple seconds, make the enemy panic by dodging back and forth, and then once you have them in a spot where you feel like you're comfortable landing it, you can just throw out the W and guarantee that E. So something pretty advanced you can do with your ultimate is if you line it up and an enemy is trying to get away but doesn't actually have the ability to, you can use your E instantly off the wall and stun them with the knockup. Now, this isn't something that you can guarantee, nor is it really something that you can set up personally, but it just happens to be like maybe enemies trying to escape and you know they're going to get knocked back into the wall. Throw your E early. As soon as you hop off, it should be able to get them with that stun on the knockup. The final thing I want to mention with ability usage is the Q flash. I have been abusing this recently just because it catches so many people off guard when the Q comes out so quickly after the flash just because of how the windup works. Especially when it comes to that big Q, just landing that massive burst of damage and slowing them. People always end up flashing in response to it, but it's already too late because they're slowed and I throw that auto attack to follow it up. So definitely try it in your own games, get a feel for that combo and use it to catch people off guard. All right, and now for obviously the most important part of the Talia guide, we have the skin tier list. Now, obviously, Tilia has no bad skins. That's why the tiers only go S, A, and A minus. Let's not talk about Star Guardian right now. I know everyone's going to be throwing hands, but I'll talk about it later, okay? Now, starting off with the S tier, we have Freljord Talia. This skin is just perfect. If you want to get a skin for Talia, this is where you go. It is an OG. It feels really crisp to play. The sound effects are good. The visuals are, in, are just amazing. So if you want to get a skin for Talia, you pick up this skin. You're going to look like you main Talia 100%. Now we do have another S tier skin on Talia and that is Crystallis Modus. This skin is super, super good. Like the sound effects feel amazing to play with. The visuals are really solid. And if you can, definitely the chroma is where it's at. I think the chroma just takes it to a whole another level. Um, but the default is fine as well. The sound effects are obviously the same and that's honestly probably the most important thing for this skin. Now, that being said, it's definitely difficult to get this skin right now, but if you got it in your back pocket, this is where you go. Now, moving on to the A tier skins, we first have the default skin for Talia. Now, honestly, this default skin has everything you would want. Solid sound effects, solid visuals for zero of the price. So if you don't want to shell out on a skin, just rock with the default. You'll be feeling great. The auto attacks are super clean when you get that CS, so totally fine to rock with the no skin. All right, now moving on, we have SSG Talia. Now, I actually really like this skin. I've been playing it quite a lot recently. And the one thing that really sets this skin apart from the others is the sound effects and just the cleanness of everything. It really feels like I'm just throwing like Greek or Roman pillars of marble at the enemy. And I think that feeling is just very nice. Like the skin is just very clean overall. It's probably like the least messy of all the skins and it has a very controlled vibe to it. For this reason, I actually think the SSG Talia feels very good with scaling setups personally. I don't know why, it's just a feel thing. That obviously doesn't mean you can't run it with fast pace setups, but just overall, if you want to go with scaling setup, SSG is kind of where it's at. So the skin feels amazing, it's super clean. All right, now moving on to the final A tier skin, we have Pool Party Talia. Now, if I'm going to be honest, when this skin first came out, I did not like playing it at all. I think it just felt clunky and the sound effects were weird, and I just really didn't like the, the feel of playing it. So I didn't play the skin for a long time, but as I got a few more games on it, I think I see the value of this skin. I think it, it is actually quite nice. Um, but I must say, you have to rock with this chroma. I don't know what is like the pink chroma or whatever it is, 
this is the the best chroma out there and it makes the skin so much better just the color scheme is so 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 good and this is definitely the opposite of ssg where ssg is scaling this is fast paced this is quick you know run electrocute with this kind of thing and really bully your laner that's just how the skin feels to me all right and for the final skin we have in the a minus tier star guardian talia now look i i get it this skin is not great i'm not gonna lie to you i think if i was not a talia main i would not touch the skin in a million years but being a talia main every now and then like you know i just got i just gotta put some games on it. it because it's just so much different in feel from all the rest of the skins it's just like a nice fresh take on talia and that's honestly like the only silver lining about the skin it doesn't look great it doesn't feel great the sound effects are weird i'm gonna be honest like it's not that it's not that good but as i tell you made sometimes i gotta go with it and honestly it feels good on those times i will say if you're gonna get the skin you have to get the black chroma it is the only way to go so if you don't do that then i i would just stay away from the skin and honestly if you're not gonna buy every skin just stick to the other skins are way better but you know it has a place every now and then so yeah that's it for the skin tier list definitely if you got to go for a skin rock with frail yord i know it's difficult to get crystal modus at this point but really any other skin than that is going to be fine it's going to feel good and honestly the default's great as well so you don't even got to worry about it too much and that is just about everything for the talia guide if you feel like i missed anything make sure to let me know in the comments and just in general i would love to hear any of the feedback that you have i stream every tuesday and saturday after every upload on youtube and twitch so you can catch me there if you want to ask me questions live if you're interested in chatting about League with others looking to improve or get information on my coaching, you can join my Discord, which will be linked in the description. That's about it for me, so thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.